Hello, welcome to By the Well podcast, produced by the community at Wall Street United Methodist Church in Jeffersonville, Indiana. We focus on clarity, compassion, and community. You will hear sermons as well as conversations about the intersections of faith and life. If you enjoy this podcast, like and share below. From Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, and verses 10 through 16. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into the boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower sower went out to sow. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For those who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand, and you will indeed look but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown, grown, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes so that they might not look in their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear the word of God for the people of God. Well, in case there was any doubt, it is summer. Um, I don't know if your week was very summery. My week was very summery. It's very hot, very hot. Um, And and so as summer kind of gets into full swing, um, we are embarking on our next worship series. Um, This series was created by our own pastor, Nancy. um, And part of what... Pastor Nancy was doing was recognizing that um, things in the summertime seem to be a little bit more flexible, right? A little bit more fluid. Many of us have um, places that we're going to be at different weekends um, over the next several weeks. Um, Some of us are going to be not able to be here every week. And so these weeks over the next, uh, this, this series are connected to each other and... And it's also possible for you to come in and out as your, as your summer schedule allows you to do so, and you'll have things um, that we can continue to grow with, right? Because what we really wanted to make sure that we did is we wanted to give you some things to really chew on this summer, right? Um, and, and so I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a little bit different, though. It's going to be a little different because we are going to be inviting you to wrestle with the text. So I'm going to set the stage for you right this second. You are not going to leave here today with one interpretation of the scriptures that Gary just read. And in the coming weeks, you're going to hear some stories, some of which are very familiar to you and some of which aren't. And you're probably not going to leave with one one perspective on those either. So... Be ready. Be ready to wrestle with things. So throughout his his ministry, the title that Jesus was most often given was teacher. That was teacher. His disciples called him that, rabbi, teacher. Um, People he encountered, um, people who invited him to dinner uh, called him teacher. The crowds that gathered around him called him teacher. Even people who um, were were opposed to how he said things or to what he said, even those folks tended to recognize him as a, as a teacher. That's what 
Jesus did. And when Jesus taught, he used parables. Now, both Matthew and Mark's gospel go as far as to say that Jesus didn't teach anything without a parable. That whenever he taught, a parable is what he used. And I read an article uh, this last week that said that they kind of you know, went through and calculated that of the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 35% of the, the content of those gospels are parables or related to parables, right? So if we're going to be students, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, it behooves us to know parables, right? To hear them, to read them, to learn them, to learn from them. And the thing that I think, at least I will say those of, like me, <laughs> I'll say those of us who grew up in the church and, and are familiar, but I'm going to say me. One of the things that I don't do often with the parables is wrestle with them, is chew on them, is encounter them um, afresh every time right? Because oftentimes we think, I know exactly what that one means. I know exactly what that one means. And it could very well be that, that a parable means that. And, right? That's my favorite, and. So what is a parable? Well, most simply put, a parable is a short story of our physical world that illuminates or shows us or tells us something about the spiritual. Right? So it's a story of this world that tells us something about the spiritual, tells us something about the kingdom of God, tells us something about the life of discipleship, tells us something about the challenges of putting our faith into action, something that tells us about the kinds of transformations that we've been talking about since Pentecost, right? This, the way that the Holy Spirit transforms us. And there are parables in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Right? There are parables in other religious traditions. There are parables even in other like, philosophical traditions. Right? So parable is a, is a genre, a short story of the physical world that illuminates something about the spiritual. It can be a little bit helpful, I think, for us to say what a parable is not. A parable is not a fable. Right? Fables are about talking animals and magic, right? Parables are about the everyday world and what that tells us about God, about humanity, about humanity, about what it means to live a life of faith. A parable, this one is tricky but important, a parable is not a secret code. It's not a secret code. They are designed to be chewed on. They are allegorical and metaphorical, um, you teachers out there can go back and remember from your lesson plans the difference between. Okay? But there's not some hidden code to be cracked, right? So, so you'll hear in uh, the parables that we'll be hearing, because we're going to be wrestling with parables from Matthew 13, the 13th chapter of Matthew, is that there are metaphors and similes, right? And we're supposed to chew on those. In Matthew 13, oftentimes the parable begins, the kingdom of heaven is like... The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like someone who planted good seed in his field. It's like a mustard seed, it's like yeast, it's like a treasure hidden in a field, it's like a fishing net. All things that were tangible and, and known to the people that Jesus was speaking with. So we're supposed to think about what those physical things illustrate about the kingdom of God for us. But what we aren't supposed to do or what we don't need to do is look for some arbitrary hidden meanings in every detail, okay? So for example, I'm going to tell, spoiler alert, you don't need to say, ooh, is, was there, is there a reason why it's a pearl of great price and not an emerald of great price or a sapphire of great price? Right? Because there have been traditions that have been like every single thing means some hidden other thing. It's not. It's not that. We chew on it, but it's not a trick, okay? So uh, parables are not tricks. Parables are not devoid of context. 
Right now, the genius of the, the parables is that they continue to resonate with us thousands of years later in a completely different context. Um, how many of you have been in the last year or two out in your fields sowing seed by hand? Uh, how many of you um, went out fishing? I know you go fishing, Steve. Did you use that big net? Yeah, sometimes, right? How many of the rest of us did? How many of you have had fish for dinner the last year? How many of you used your net to catch it? All right, right. So, so there's a different context, right? There's different practices, there's different languages. But it doesn't mean that the parables themselves are devoid of context, even though they continue to resonate with us today. So as we chew on the parables, it is good. And that's one of the things we're going to be doing, is to consider who, what's the context of the parable when Jesus tells it? Like, who's in the audience? Why is Jesus telling it? Like, was the, did somebody ask a question? Um, was there a situation that Jesus was responding to? We look at what are other parables nearby? Because again, we're talking about like Matthew 13 is really kind of a collection of parables. Um, it's not necessarily that Jesus was telling them back to back to back, but they're collected in that spot, right? So why would Matthew collect those, those particular parables together? Right? So we want to look at those contexts. The other thing a parable is not is a parable is not one thing. It's not one thing. Good stories show us more than one thing. And one thing that the parables are, are really, really good stories, right? But they, because they're good stories, they encompass many things. So one of the parables we will not be looking at, so this isn't a spoiler, is the parable of the prodigal son. And if you think about that, it is about many things. It is about the son's repentance and the father's forgiveness and the older brother's resentment and the friend's rejoicing, right? It's about all of those things. And each of those things tell us something about the kingdom of God. They tell us something about what it means to be human. They tell us something about God's care for us in our goodness and in our not so goodness, right? So a parable is more than one thing. And that's, that, those last two, I think, are especially essential for our approach to chewing on parables this summer. So contemporary mystic and writer Stephen Reynolds puts it this way. Interpretations of parables are not, are not explanations. Where such interpretations are given, they may unlock some aspects, but should not be accepted uncritically and are not exhaustive. To be told that a parable was told for that purpose or means this should in no way stop us from exploring what it means for us and from our own experience. Because most of the parables in the Gospels anyway don't come with a commentary or an interpretation. You're going to hear a couple, especially in the first couple of weeks, where Jesus tells a story and then later he has an explanation. But most parables don't have that. But even when an interpretation or a key is given, it may elucidate the story, but we are also meant to grapple with them for ourselves. And that's what we'll be doing in this series, is grappling with these parables for ourselves while not ignoring the context or the traditions around them. So, those are what parables are, but why would Jesus use parables so much? Why did he teach with parables? Why did parables become kind of the hallmark of his teaching? Well, I think one reason Jesus used parables is because Jesus is a good teacher. He's a good teacher. Um, Zoe... Uh, had a, a English teacher her freshman year of high school named Mr. Henderson, absolutely a relation. Um, meet the teacher night. We went in, met Mr. Henderson, and Mr. Henderson was talking to Zoe, and he said, you know, if there's ever anything 
that I say up here that doesn't make any sense to you there, tell me. It's like, because I got a whole bunch of different ways to say it. And that's what Jesus is doing in his teaching, right? I, I, I say again, you know, and you've heard me say this. This is one of my favorite things. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is so incredible that even Jesus had to say it's like this and it's like this and it's like this and it's like this because for those of us who have never been fishing with a net, that might not resonate with us, but we may resonate with the idea of making bread. Or we may resonate with the idea of, of, um, of, of going out and celebrating, right? So Jesus tells parables because he's a good teacher. And he tells parables because there's a way for us to engage with all sorts of very complex things in all sorts of different ways. But Jesus himself also gives an explanation for why he teaches with parables, and you heard Gary read it. And I hate the reason that Jesus gave. Um, in our call to worship, we said, you know, we don't, we don't grapple with or we don't want to even look at the things that we don't like. And I have spent the last several weeks trying mightily, striving, Becky, with all of my heart, not to pay any attention to the explanation that Jesus gives as to why he pre preaches in parables. I don't like it. Why do I not like it? I don't like it because I'm uncomfortable with this idea that God has somehow created division. My experience with God has been, and this is my experience with God, is that God delights in knowing and being known that God wants God's creation to know God, that God wants to be in connection and community with us. And so that's how I approach a lot of the, the scriptures that I read, the stories that I hear Jesus tell. But Jesus says, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. I don't like that. Um, so how has that been interpreted? Well, oftentimes it's interpreted then as an, an us and them, right? Um, even within Christian traditions, right? That there's Christian traditions that we've got it right and you've got it wrong. Certainly other religions got it wrong, we got it right. Um, there's, there's some things that that there's, that there's this knowledge that, that, that lets us into a, a deeper relationship with God or a fuller experience of the Christian life. And that has certainly been something that has been played out over the, two, the last 2,000 years, right? Is that there, this idea that there is this or that. Um, if I'm grappling with that passage, though, and I've been grappling with it, what I kept coming back to was the passage that, that Pastor Nancy wants to keep before us. And that's this idea that we, if we understand with our heart and turn, we would be healed. And that made me think of, of a, some, some things I had, had seen as something that a colleague of mine had said that Studies have shown that when people get a significantly um, uh, serious health diagnosis, cancer, heart condition, vulnerability to stroke, only about 50% of people will change anything or change enough of how they live their life to make a difference in that diagnosis. Now, it depends. Sometimes they're, you know, sometimes a couple, it's 40%, sometimes it's 60%. But if they look at like the number of people who quit smoking after they get a cancer diagnosis, but then are smoking again four years later, right? Or people who are um, um, at risk for heart disease and, and cut way back on the salt, 
but then they look at three years later, French fries are back on the menu, right? So I kept on thinking about if we get a diagnosis that our, health, our physical health can be affected by these changes, and half of us won't make those changes, then perhaps it's not a surprise that when God says, here's a way to live your life that will be more fulfilling, that will be more full of life, that will be more complete, that half of us say, oh, oh I'd love to, but. Because it's really hard to change. It's hard to transform. It's hard to continue to change, to continue to be open. Um, I don't know about you, but there have been lots of times when, I, you know, the spiritual disciplines, I would love to tell you that I'm consistent with those. But there will often be ebbs and flows, fits and starts of my engagement with those. I, I wonder then, as I grapple with that, with Jesus' explanation, if that's kind of what he's getting at. Not so much that, that God himself says, um, I'm going to arbitrarily, let's count off by ones. One, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, ones, you get to understand. Twos, so sorry. I wonder if instead it is this idea that God shares everything with all of us. And many of us decide, oh, I just don't want to grapple with that. I don't want to chew on that. I don't want to let that change me. I don't want to continue to be changed. I don't want to, a year from now still have to be doing that. Couldn't I just be nice once and then I'm done, right? I wonder if that's what it's, what it's, getting, about, what it's getting to. So of the 50 people who make changes, one of the things that in, in different studies that I looked at said that where people are most successful in making changes that they are able to maintain, they do it because they are given great support, richer information. So if your doctor just comes to you and says, you need to eat better and exercise more, your odds are not good for making any changes. But if your doctor comes in and says, you need to eat differently, and here are the things that you need to eat, and here are the things that you should avoid, and here is the number of my nurse practitioner who, can, who would be happy to, to talk to you anytime you have a question, um, and here, is, here are some ways to begin exercising that are gonna help you ease into that. Here are some ideas for how you might have a habit of that. People who get that are more likely to make changes that last. I think that's why Jesus uses parables. Because they are so rich and Jesus could, come out, could have come out and said, okay, here is the list. Got this straight from heaven. Do this, don't do that, do that, don't do this. Uh, say that, don't talk to that person, do talk to this person. Um, on Tuesdays, we do it differently. And it would have been simpler, and it probably would have been lost to time, right? But having a story gives us that support of something to chew on, something that is so rich that the next time we come to it, right? Because sometimes we are the youngest son, and sometimes we are the oldest son, and sometimes we're the dad, and sometimes we're the friends, Sometimes we're the fatted calf. We come to that story, that parable, and find something new to chew on, something new that can support us at every phase of our life. What all those questions that we have of what does it mean to live in community with God and each other. Right? So, we are supposed to Chew on scriptures. This transformation is hard, and it's ongoing. And you're not going to have any particular easy answer. Everything that I've said today could be 
one way of understanding and chewing on the passage that Gary read. But maybe that doesn't taste good to you and you'd like to chew on it a different way. Good. That's what we're supposed to do. Because really, the choices that we have, and it's a choice, is will we listen but never understand? Not because God doesn't want to be known, but because we decide it's just, it's just too much to keep chewing on. Or will we chew on these parables in such a way that they can live in our hearts, that they can be part of transforming us so that we can turn and be healed? Why did Jesus teach in parables? For many reasons. And one of them was to heal us and make us whole. So... Are you ready for that adventure this summer? Let's chew on it a little bit. You have been listening to By the Well podcast from Wall Street United Methodist Church. Thank you for being part of our community. Just a reminder to visit us at wallstreetumc.org, and we invite you to like and share our podcast wherever you listen.